Welcome to the Economic Rockstar Podcast with your host, Frank Conway. Connecting brilliant minds in economics and finance. In this week's episode of the Economic Rockstar Podcast, I speak with Zachary Feinstein, Professor of Electrical and Systems Engineering at Washington University. We talk about the economics of Star Wars and Harry Potter, and how the theme of systemic risk is common in both and reflects actual events that happens in economies when there's financial crises. Professor Feinstein talks about the costs of building and rebuilding the Death Star and uses a proxy such as the Manhattan Project that built the atomic bomb as a way of calculating the costs of the construction of the Death Star and where the resources and finance would come from in the Star Wars galaxy. We also talk about potential systemic risk in the Harry Potter series when it comes to the monopoly that the Gringotts Wizardry Bank has. Professor Feinstein also explains how he runs simulations to identify what happens in systemic crises if it's generated by currency exchanges, given the example of the Russian ruble. You can check out all the links, books and resources mentioned by Professor Feinstein over at economicrockstar.com forward slash Zachary Feinstein or economicrockstar.com forward slash Star Wars. Never miss an episode of the Economic Rockstar podcast. Visit economicrockstar.com, submit your name and email, and you will get each episode straight to your inbox. What would happen after you blow up the second Death Star? What does that do to the financial system, which is an application of my actual research to Star Wars? I looked at, well, why did people follow Voldemort? This is, again, kind of the question of why did people join the First, uh, the first Order in Star Wars? There's going to be some racists. There are going to be some people that really are supportive of kind of the cultural aspects of that one in autocratic rule. The main thing that I want to highlight in this is yeah, I like I kind of I call them my joke papers, like the Harry Potter, the Star Wars. This is my joke work, but it's real academic work. Hi, Frank Conway here, and you're listening to the Economic Rockstar Podcast. I'm so honored to have Zachary Feinstein join me today. Hi, Zachary, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. Zachary Feinstein is a professor at the Preston M. Green Department of Electrical and Systems Engineering at Washington it's, University. So I'm a professor in the Department of Electrical and Systems Engineering. At University, Zachary I do financial the engineering. Writing group and assisted in teaching several courses. Previously, he conducted research at Hunan University in China and was an intern at Millennium Partners LP and Lehman Brothers, both in New York City. Professor Feinstein works in the broad fields of operations research and financial engineering, and he heads the Operations Research and Financial Engineering Laboratory at Washington University. His research focus has been on the applications of set optimization to financial risk measurement with projects studying and defining dynamic risk measures in markets with transaction costs and measures of systemic risk. Professor Feinstein has also written a lot on the economics of Star Wars and you can find his work on Star Wars and more by googling fictionomics. Zachary, this is so, so interesting what you're doing and Especially the timing of when this podcast is going to be going out is when they will be releasing the new Rogue One Star Wars movie. Now, I'd love to find out firstly how you got from risk measurement and financial engineering to Star Wars and what's the connection. So this really all started back in high school and I would have these conversations with friends on the economic system in the Star Wars galaxy and where things didn't quite add up. And then some point in the summer 2015, I kind of realized that I'm now actually credentialed enough to do the real study that we were talking about in high school. So I went through, I came up with the cost of the Death Star, and I came, and I thought about what would happen after you blow up the second Death Star, what does that do to the financial system, which is an application of my actual research to Star Wars. Okay, so your research prior to this will be on systemic risk? Yes. And I think it's uh, financial crises and contagion? Exactly. So systemic risk, the quick way of describing it really is 2008-like events. Could you elaborate on what systemic risk is, just in case any listeners may not be sure of it? So systemic risk is the risk of the financial system failing. 
So rather than worrying about a portfolio or a bank, you're worried about the system as a whole. So this is really where you get the idea of too big to fail or too interconnected to fail, is that if one of these institutions, these uh, systemically important institutions, were to fail, it by itself could take down the entire system. Um, so we saw this in 2008 where Bear Stearns, Lehman Brothers, AIG, their failures or near failures really put the entire world's financial system very close to utter shutdown. You obviously identified this in high school with the, the Death Star. And it makes sense because once the first Death Star blows up, I, I'm sure that's the the empire completely mm -hmm. destroyed. A lot of finance and even the scarce resources that were used to build that yep. have been destroyed. And then in order to replace it, what institutions were there? And, and replace it with a larger, a larger world. Death Star. Yeah, actually... You did a paper that estimated the costs of both Death Stars, and you yes. used a proxy of the HSS Ford. Gerald Ford, yes. Okay, I'd love to, for you to elaborate on that, actually. Yeah, so to come up with the costs, I started out, there was actually a petition to the White House uh, in 2012 to build a Death Star. And it, being the internet, it got enough signatures that they needed to respond. And they started off saying, well, a Death Star is estimated to cost $850 quadrillion, and we're trying to reduce the debt. So this is just not feasible. And so I, I look at that, and I go back through their uh, sources to find where this $850 quadrillion number comes from. And that is actually only for the steel that would be required to build a Death Star. So I don't know about you, but I thought about it and said, I have $850 quadrillion worth of steel and I throw it in a pile, it's probably not going to build a Death Star. Mm -hmm. And that number came from how, like, basically assuming the uh, Death Star had the same density as an aircraft carrier. So I took it one step further and found what the ratio of steel cost for an aircraft carrier to the full cost and scaling that up to the $850 quadrillion steel for the Death Star. And that actually led to a cost for the first Death Star of 193 quintillion dollars. Wow. So it's 193 <laughs> followed by 18 zeros. Is there any money like that at all on Earth? No. So world GDP, so the gross world product right now, is on the order of about 70 trillion. So you go trillions, then quadrillions, then quintillions. So this is many order of magnitude larger than Earth. But we have to keep in mind, though, that in Star Wars, they have interstellar travel and they have 1.75 million worlds in the Empire. So this 193 quintillion dollars is immense for us, but we need to figure out what size it is in terms of the galactic economy. Um, so actually, as we're going to see in Rogue One, where they're building this first Death Star over 20 years they need to do all this research and development in order to figure out how to make this super laser, how to get the Death Star to travel at interstellar, uh, to have interstellar travel, travel at hyperspeed. I then said this is a massive military research and development project. So to make a comparison, I used the Manhattan Project to build the first atomic bomb. Uh, so from 1942 to 1946, the Manhattan Project took about 0.21% of U.S. GDP per year. So massive military research and development project. Let's use this 0.21% of GGP, gross galactic product, per year was spent on building the first Death Star. And this is over a 20-year period. So averaging out over those 20 years, we would get approximately $4.6 sextillion as their gross galactic product. So... 193 quintillion sounds like a massive amount, but compared to 4.6 sextillion, this is not, it's not unreasonable. And is that because there are 1.7 million worlds and the empire, obviously, I doubt it has taken over all these worlds, but has taken over a certain portion of them and probably strips them from the resources or strips the resources from them. So this is exactly because it's, a more advanced society than we are. They have interstellar travel. It uh, has far more worlds than we have. It has a hundred quadrillion people 
in the empire, citizens of the empire. So this is something where it is a much larger economy than Earth is. But that being said, if you actually divide by the 1.75 million worlds, this isn't that impressive compared to the world GDP. And part of this actually comes from, you have to think, some of these planets are going to be like Hoth, where it's just a, a ice planet. Some of them, uh, you have the jungle moon of Endor, the forest moon of Endor. So there's not, a lot of these worlds aren't going to be as developed as perhaps uh, Coruscant is, or as advanced, at, like they're not all going to be just city planets that are focused on economic revitalization. The other thing that we do see and this comes from actually before the prequel trilogies, for about 25 millennia during the Republic, there was economic stagnation. There was no economic growth for a significantly long time. And this is actually the precursor to the separatist movement and the wars we see in the prequel trilogy, which of course lead to Emperor Palpatine's takeover uh, and ultimately to the original trilogy. So these economic forces that, while they're lar much larger than Earth, could be much larger for the technology that they have. It's just there's been this economic stagnation uh, that really keeps things at a constant level. When General Palpatine or Emperor Palpatine or General Palpatine became emperor, well, you wrote a paper called It's a Trap, Emperor Palpatine's Poison Pill. Yes. And you look at the financial repercussions of the destruction of the Death Star or the two Death Stars mm -hmm. and how this draws similarities to the financial crisis that we experienced. I know you touched on them earlier on with Burr Stearns and so on. Yeah. How could it be that systemic risk within the empire? So, is yeah, the so what I really found is you have the Rebel Alliance as this ragtag uh, group. They don't have much resources. And the financial system in the Empire was deregulated. Um, and we actually know that from the Clone Wars animated television show. They have an episode where they talk about deregulating the banks. So they have a deregulated system. The rebels do not have the resources to prop up any banks that might be on the verge of failure. So there's not going to be this TARP bailout if it's necessary. And what really would happen is the rebels will not uh, will repudiate the debt for the Death Stars. They're not going to be a group that can agree that we should pay off what the Empire took out as debt for these Death Stars. On top of this, I estimate that as 515.5 quintillion debt that would be repudiated. On top of that, the rebels, as seen by the elites, by the bankers, are going to be a terrorist organization. And they are now a terrorist organization that successfully killed Emperor Palpatine, killed, Death, uh, killed Darth Vader, destroyed the Death Star, you're going to see a massive shock to the markets from this successful terrorist attack if you're part of the status quo. So looking at past terrorist attacks, so how the markets reacted to September 11th, and there was also a fake tweet in uh, 2013 uh, that there was a terrorist attack at the White House, a uh, fake tweet by the Associated Press, um, and in a four-minute window before that was corrected, the market had already dropped 1%. So I estimated because this was a successful attack, the markets overnight would probably drop about 20% uh, on average. So these are massive failures in the market. If the market drops 20%, this is a huge, this is Great Depression level drops in the market. So from this, the banks now have to pay off their own debts. And they would not be able to do so because the market dropped 20% and the government's not paying the debt that they were owed, that they owed to the banks. And through this, through the financial system, this would actually have a cascading effect of one bank fail failing would spread to more banks failing. So we have this cascading failures of the banking system that ultimately in the financial system alone, I estimated, would have on average about 12.9% drop in GGP, just from the financial system. And this number, this is a stochastic random number, it went as high as 30%. So drop in GGP just from the financial sector in the immediate aftermath of the Battle of Endor. And in comparison, the U.S. during the Great Depression, 
from 1929 to 1933, so peak to trough, was a drop of 26.7% in GDP. So this is an event that would completely wipe out any kind of galactic economy that existed. And I actually take this farther and say, we have the end of Battle of Endor, end of Episode 6, everyone is happy that the Empire has lost. And then we fast forward 30 years to Episode 7, uh, to The Force Awakens, and there's uh, the First Order is around, there's kind of war, war still going on, and trying to figure out why this happened. And what we see is Jakku, there's essentially no economy. It's a scavenging economy. And elsewhere, there doesn't seem to be all that much economic growth that was occurring from this. So one of the reasons we might have this 30-year time gap is there was a Great Depression across the entire galaxy that they're finally recovering from. Um, and this would be why people would go back to authoritarian rule like the First Order, because they have this economic instability. They're just wondering where they're going to get their next meal from. And then the First Order comes around and promises them a meal, uh, promises them stability, and a lot of people would go for that, uh, as we see historically. Yeah, that's what I was just going to say. That's very much true to real life. Yeah. Even recently with the financial crisis, we see a lot of right-wing support. Yeah. Across Europe, and I don't know if you could call that in America either, but across Europe anyway, and even destruction within the Middle East or Africa, mm -hmm. and the, the support that non-democratic economies would give and perhaps make promises, yep. and people would like that, especially if they if there's no recovery. Yep. People tend to fall back and look for change, and if someone promises the life that had existed beforehand they're going to perhaps follow that. Exactly. And we've seen that being played out in The Force Awakens. Exactly. So this is where I, this is my explanation for how we went from episode six, uh, where everyone is celebrating the fall of the empire, to episode seven, where half the galaxy is ruled by the uh, First Order, which is an extremely powerful autocratic military rule. Is it because the Rebel Alliance remained rebels or aren't really good politicians or leaders so part of it is they didn't have the finances in place in order to bail out the banks that would be necessary and they didn't have the strategy for in some sense winning the peace so they start off they have this great strategy for defeating emperor palpatine winning the war but then they're only like they're the rebel alliance. It's an alliance of these different groups. So as we saw in Libya, as we kind of see in Syria, these groups can work together to fight a common enemy. But once that enemy has actually been defeated, they're going to have the infighting. They're going to have all the problems that the Republic, the Galactic Republic had, which led to the empire. So what type of economic resources is you discovered it in your paper, but what type of economic resources do the rebel alliance need in order to prevent that financial crisis yes. from spreading throughout the galaxy. Yes. Yeah, so to make that economic crisis, so this 12.9% on average crisis, to make it just the levels of the Great Recession, uh, so about 1% drop in GGP in the immediate aftermath, that would require on the order of about 15 to 20% of the gross galactic product. Uh, so this is on the order of generally greater than one sextillion dollars, assuming a 2% growth rate. So this 4.6 uh, sextillion that I uh, mentioned before was an average, assuming the empire had 2% economic growth each year by the time of the Battle of Endor, that would be 6.09 sextillion dollars. And about 15 to 20% of that would be necessary to bail out the galactic economy. I just wonder, I know it's all speculation what happened in that 30 year period, but I'm sure yep. they have to do it by raising taxes and people are not going to be quite happy with that. And perhaps that's why yep. they wanted to go with the first order because that first order, I don't know where they're getting their economic resources or financing, perhaps from other galaxies or other worlds. Yeah, so it's all speculation, I guess. It's all, it's speculation, but part of it is the First Order has the clear cont uh, continuation from the Empire. 
So if you were one of these bankers that lost a lot of money, but your bank is still around, the intergalactic banking clan, for instance, uh, which essentially backed the galactic credit, so as, as close to a central bank as exists in Star Wars, they were doing quite well under Emperor Palpatine. So they might be amenable to providing funding to the First Order to kind of get this Starkiller base going. And I haven't crunched the numbers on how much a Starkiller base would cost, but I do think there is a good possibility that it will be cheaper than a Death Star because they're using a nearby star to power it, uh, so they don't need their own internal power supply. They're using an already made planet. They don't have to build some build the infrastructure of the planet itself. They just need to kind of hollow out certain parts. Um, so this is in some sense, building a Death Star on the cheap. Uh, they're using the natural resources that are around in order to make a super weapon. I'm just curious to know, I, I know there are a lot of economic themes within this, and you're obviously a numbers guy from all the statistics you're throwing out there. What other economic themes seem to dominate or perhaps be intertwined with what you're talking about if you have identified them? I know there's, you mentioned inequality. Yes, on, on Jakku. And so on Jakku, there's kind of the scavenging economy uh, where we had Ray, if we see in episode seven, where Ray is just going to destroyed uh, spaceships, presumably from a prior battle, and just scavenging the technology from them and selling them for food. She's not getting, uh, it's not a robust economy. It's taking technology that you scavenge and selling it for food. So this really gives us a sense of how bad the economy is on Jakku. Similarly, actually in episode four on Tatooine, Luke is a moisture farmer. So this is a galaxy where they have hyperspace travel. You really can do, uh, you can travel between stars, ignoring the rules of relativity. And Luke is farming for water. So this is something that you would think there could be some sort of irrigation system that is built. So Tatooine is not part of the Empire. So you can't blame Emperor Palpatine for what's going on on Tatooine. But you do think that someone would build an irrigation system for Tatooine that would be cheaper than being a moisture farmer. So there are there's a significant amount of inequality, a significant amount of misaligned resources away from kind of these high reward propositions of making the desert bloom. Zachary, from this then, from your research and the articles that you have on fictionomics, you are now in the finality of completing the Wookiee-nomics book. Uh, so I, I'm not. <laughs> or no, not. what you're getting there, yeah? Uh, I would like to. Uh, we'll see how timing works. And how is that going for you? Uh, so Time-consuming, obviously. It's time-consuming. So... <laughs> It's just, I'm writing these blog posts on fictionomics.com, and at some point it would be very nice to kind of combi compile a lot of this into a book. So I have, as well as the It's a Trap, Emperor Palpatine's Poison Pill, a month ago I released a paper on Harry Potter yes. and the Goblin Bank of Gringotts, yes. where I looked at uh, the fact that in the Harry Potter, in the Potterverse, Gringotts is the only bank in the wizarding UK, which certainly makes it too big to fail. Mm -hmm. So looking at what the implications policy that should be implemented to avoid a systemic crisis in the wizarding world. I was actually going to talk to you about the Goblin Bank of Gringotts. Yep. And it has a monopoly. It does. In the paper, you discuss how this could be a problem of too big to fail and it could should be actually broken up into smaller institutions. Well, so I looked at whether breaking it up into smaller institutions would be beneficial. And on first order study, so assuming that each bank, each of these smaller, the baby goblins, as I call them, would perform similarly to, they would not change their strategies from Gringotts as a whole. Um, so each one would you just sum them up and you get Gringotts as a whole. By actually doing that in, in a systemic crisis, it would actually make things worse. Because instead of as the single institution where it can essentially bail itself out, it would now require external bailouts to keep 
the smaller pieces from failing. Okay. So this is you draw lines with the Glass Steagall Act. Yes, yeah, so, in the U.S. So this is that was part of the what I was looking at is on the first order effect. So this is ignoring some of the moral hazards that would go on, where if these are smaller institutions, they may change their strategy to be less risky and therefore make the system perform better. But on the first order effects, assuming that all bank, the smaller banks are not changing their strategy from when they were a piece of Gringotts itself, this really would make the system worse. If they were to undergo stress tests, just like right now, as we're talking, Italy is, yep. you know, they're talking about the possibility of some of those banks failing and repercussions it'll have on the economy. Yep. Has this kind of come forth or is it more in the background as to what could possibly happen within the Harry Potter series if, or is this your just, your imag- you're creating the scenario whereby if the Bank of Gringotts uh, collapsed. Yeah, so this 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 was me doing stress tests. So I, <laughs> I I posited it as we have it from reading Harry Potter and the Cursed Child. And reading this, we know that Hermione becomes the Minister of Magic. And being one of the cleverest witches or wizards of her generation, she would want to look at the financial risk that is involved in having this monopoly bank. So I did the public service of writing this paper for her <laughs> and doing the stress test to see whether they should implement a kind of Glass-Steagall Act in the wizarding world. Okay, so I, I was just trying to think of a name for it, but you would obviously have to have your name there as the Feinstein Act yeah. of the wizarding, wizarding world. Yes. Um, yes, and I, I love the, the articles that you actually wrote about in terms of looking at the populations and again it's your numbers yeah. your mind thinking in terms of numbers and trying to extrapolate or trying to estimate from the student population at, at hogwarts yes at hogwarts what the actual wizard and witch population is in the uk yes yeah, so it would be approximately 10,000 wizards or wizards and witches in the uk in the in the potterverse and this is just coming from the demographic numbers of there's on average, about a thousand students at Hogwarts. This is over a seven years studies. So looking at the demographics of the UK, the age group that that would be, and scaling it up or down, this gives us an estimate of about 10,000 witches or wizards. And then really what I did with that is I looked at, well, why did people follow Voldemort? This is again kind of the question of why did people join the first, uh, the first order in Star Wars? There's going to be some racists. There are going to be some people that really are supportive of kind of the cultural aspects of that one in autocratic rule. But really, if we assume Hogwarts was built in the 900s, and it does not seem to have really grown in size. So if we assume there was a thousand students back 900 years ago, as there are today, that would mean there would be significantly more witches and wizards as a fraction of the population in the past. And as we kind of see with economies um, right now, Europe and Japan, where as the population shrinks, it hurts the economy. How Economic growth is very much tied to population growth. So if you have kind of this remembrance of better times in the past, of kind of a return to greatness, if you will, then people are going to be drawn by this nostalgia and think that, yes, we should be in charge. We should have these economic policies. Um, and that might get some people to support a dark wizard like Lord Voldemort. And that has economic catastrophes then, So, as you pointed yeah, out. So this, so this is really from the fact... <laughs> Bringing it back to economics. Yep, so this is drawn from the economics, drawn from the fact that the population is shrinking, which would harm the economy, which would really get kind of a popular rebellion going against the status quo. Was there anything that played out in the Harry Potter series as to how this would impact the the town in which Hogwarts is based in or where, even where Harry Potter is from originally? Yeah, so this is really like it would be UK wide in terms of how the economy is doing. So with 10,000 witches and wizards, this is the equivalent of a small town. They might be geographically dispersed, but they can travel through the flu network. Some of them can apparate. So really, 
This is not a problem of being geographically dispersed. They can get anywhere they need to relatively easily. So this is the economy of a small town that has been hit hard by decreasing, relatively decreasing population, relatively decreasing magical abilities. Because if the population is decreasing, we could assume in some sense that the amount of magic in the world is decreasing. And we see that in Lord of the Rings. We see that in Game of Thrones. Uh, so this is something that's common in a lot of fantasy universes. And if magic's decreasing and much of their economy is based on the use of magic, it's going to mean the economy is weaker. Can I ask you, you mentioned your website, fictionomics.com. Yes. And I've seen posts there on the Game of Thrones as well and mm -hmm. the Hulk. Yep. Is this what you mean when you said you're working on the book that you're going to bring all this together as one book? Or is this the Wookiee-nomics is going to be just specifically for Star Wars? So this is something that I'm not sure how I'm going to do it yet, whether it's going to stick with Star Wars or whether it's going to branch out into all realms of fiction. So the blog, Fictionomics.com, is really just about all realms of fiction. I don't restrict myself to Star Wars. Uh, so I've done work with the Marvel Cinematic Universe and the Avengers. Uh, I've looked at Game of Thrones. I looked at Sharknado, actually. So it's sort of just whatever is catching my attention at that point. If I have a good, uh, an idea that seems interesting, I'll write it down. So it's a matter of, in terms of a book, I don't know where it will be at this point. I don't know how far in the future it might be to say what that's going to look like. How do your what do your colleagues think of this? Because you're, you're heading the operations research and financial engineering lab as well. And they might think, is this something, an outlet for you that kind of keeps your interest in economics and the finance aspects of uh, banking and uh, systemic risks? Or is this something that people respect that it is serious work because it is useful to understand the economic finance concepts? that you actually deliver at a, an academic level? Yeah, so this is something that people, academics are supportive of. It's public outreach. So it's taking the real research. It's writing, these are academic papers. It's a Trap, Emperor Palpatine's Poison Pill, and Harry Potter and the Goblin Bank of Gringotts are true academic papers. I give the citations. I go through all of the mathematics, all the properties that I have. But by putting it in these kind of fun terms, by looking at pop culture, it gets a larger audience to see this, which has great value in the academic world. So public outreach is the purpose of this. If you were to be one, what would you be, a wizard or a Jedi Knight? Jedi Knight. Why? Um, it seems like the Jedi Knights have a little more, they're a little calmer. They have kind of this meditative way about them. Kind of you have your like warrior monk, if you will. And many of their powers are very similar to wizarding powers. They're able to do the Jedi mind trick. They're able to move things with the force. Whereas with wizards, they're very much more in our world. So one, I'm able to travel the stars. I'd really love to be an astronaut if I could. So just being able to actually do that would be amazing. But yeah, I have I have to go with Jedi. Jedi, yeah, I think I'd be a Jedi Knight as well. Who would want to turn down a lightsaber? Exactly. If you could step into the DeLorean and time travel, what era would you go back to? Who would you like to meet and what conversation would you think you would have? Ooh. Personally, I'd like to go back to ancient Rome. That's just a personal interest of mine. Of course, as we saw in Back to the Future, there's all sorts of issues with the timeline and making sure that I still exist. Yes. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so in, if we're using those rules, I might not actually use the time machine. This seems a little dangerous, <laughs> but assuming I don't have to worry about that too much. So if we go more Doctor Who TARDIS level use of time travel, I'd really love to see ancient Rome. It's just a personal interest of mine, but yeah, it, having the conversations might be a little tough since I am not fluent in Latin. <laughs> I couldn't imagine you in sandals either if that's stereotyping those gladiator sandals are yeah <laughs> perhaps <laughs> um, and regarding your work that you're doing uh, you're doing a lot of writing and research yes and I usually ask this is if you have any writing tips you'd like to share with our listeners I'd love to find out maybe one to three top tips so the main tip that I have, and I tell this to my students as well, is just to write it down. Get something on the page 
and then afterwards you can mark it up with red as much as you want. Uh, but don't worry about getting the right sentence down. Just get something on the page and then move it all around, mark it up, completely delete it if you want. But once it's on the page, it's much easier to move forward than worrying about the perfect sentence to start. Can I go back to maybe some academic work? You know, the lab we were talking about, yep. financial engineering. Yep. What exactly do you do there? Do you simulate events and measure risk? Yep. Or how? What, what is actually, what do you tend to do in that type of lab, laboratory? Yeah, so it's really mathematical work. So in my lab, we it's essentially a lot of whiteboards and desk space. So right now, a lot of the work that's going on is trying to improve these models of systemic risk. I'm the first to admit that all the models that we have for systemic risk are toy models. They're first order approximations. So how can we improve these approximations? How can we improve these models in order to make better simulations, make better recommendations on uh, what would happen if we broke up Gringotts, for instance, or what would happen to the Star Wars galaxy after destroying the second Death Star. So just trying to improve these models, trying to improve how you can measure the risk in the system, and doing it all mathematically rigorous. So a lot of the work is we write down an, a mathematical economic model, and then we try to prove that it has certain properties. We try to prove that it has a unique solution or what, how many solutions it might have. Um, and doing this all very mathematically, doing the theorem proof type of thing that many people maybe aren't as much a fan of. I love it. That's what I would do all day if I could, as well as watch movies and TV. <laughs> <laughs> I was just going to say, actually, um, do you get criticized for doing the tier and proofs? Um, some people prefer maybe to look at outcomes and then, you know, do the inverse of that as such. Yeah. So this is in some way the, the difference between economics and finance and financial engineering. So if you're in kind of a finance department, more traditionally, you're going to look at the outcomes and work backwards from that. Whereas like in terms of like one of the models I'm working on, I came up with the idea by looking at there was a Russia, I guess, a year ago, uh, two years ago now, their currency collapsed very quickly over the course of a week. And this was very much generated by systemic contagion. It was the Russian banks and corporations were borrowing in dollars and euros, but were making their income in Russian rubles. And then as the currency started to fall, they had to pay out in dollars and euros, which meant they had to transfer their rubles to dollars and euros, which further exacerbated the fall in the currency. And this made the crisis far worse than it would have been originally. So I took this idea of what happened in Russia and I kind of simplified it significantly and put it into a mathematical model of what happens in a systemic crisis if it's generated by currency exchanges. So it's looking at, like, I'm starting with real the real world, but bringing it back to say, I don't care about any specific system. I care about how mathematically this kind of crisis would work. That's extremely important because, well... I, I, I don't know the level, obviously, that you're you're bringing to us uh, as uh, financial economists yeah. or economists, but it's extremely important to understand the mathematical or mm -hmm. the repercussions mathematically. Yes. So that I know systems are different, cultures are different, and there might be some degree of uh, corruption as well. Mm -hmm. Um, whether that's going to be filtered through the model, but as you said, it's simplified to kind of strip perhaps yep. all of that out and look at the core reaction of exactly. a systemic risk through the, this mathematical model. And um, what finding did you come up with regarding that model itself, or what proof and axioms or theories or something yeah. that you came up with there? Yeah, so that that one, uh, which is I'm um, still work in progress, so I'm writing it up. But the main result is that this very a complicated looking mathematical system, I have that there exists a solution and certain continuity properties of that solution. So it really is coming down to just saying this model is consistent with itself, which means that if you wanted to, you could simulate it 
Uh, you could try to uh, calibrate it to a real system. You can simulate it, and you could see doing stress tests what would happen. And could that be applied prior to an event whereby you might see a a country, say for example, like Russia, borrowing in euros and dollars, and then making their income in Russian rubles? Could you anticipate yeah. what the likely outcome is if you were to apply that model mathematically? Yeah. So certainly, if you had the detailed enough data. You could okay. plug it into a model like this and you could say, okay, let's, what would happen if the Russian ruble were to fall by 2%? What would be the outcome from this event? Um, and then kind of see like, well, where's the tipping point where it goes from, well, it goes from 2% to 3%, like kind of a small thing, whereas it might go from 5% and now it jumps down to a 15% drop through this contagion event. Um, Zachary, I'd love to know if you have any recommended books. I'd actually be quite interested with what you'll come up with. And I'd say you have a diversity spanning your type of interest that you actually showed us earlier on. Uh, so I'm a big fan of the Foundation Trilogy by Asimov. Yes. So I'd always recommend that to anyone, as well as pretty much any book by Neil Stevenson. So these are kind of speculative fiction uh, is probably the best description of the genre. So he wrote Anathem, which I'm a huge fan of. Uh, he wrote Cryptonomicon and a few other, Diamond Age, I'm blanking on a few other ones, but I love them all and they're very great world building. That's really, he's great at doing the world building and I've yet to find a hook to say, you know what, the economics in this doesn't make sense. Yes, and I'd say there's, I haven't read them at all, but I say there's yep. a lot of economics in there too. Yep. Especially if they're futuristic and especially with Asimov's, I don't know what the foundation trilogy is, but a lot of robotics and AI and so on, it'll be fantastic. Yep. And that's, and, you know, plays on, he's, he's such a visionary yep. in terms of what we're experiencing and where we're heading yes. of late. Zachary, is, if there's anything else you'd like to maybe touch on or I don't, I don't know if I want to go into the Game of Thrones at all because <laughs> uh, I think it's going to be too much in the heading yep. in terms of Harry Potter and Star Wars. <laughs> yeah, so really the main thing that I want to highlight in this is, yeah, I like, I kind of, I call them my joke papers, like the Harry Potter, the Star Wars. This is my joke work, but it's real academic work. Yes. It's just yes. joke in that it's fun. It's accessible to a broader audience than my usual theorem proof type of paper. And I've had numerous guests on the podcast that have talked about their type of research based on movies and books. And yep. even one recently, he's done the economics of superheroes. Mm -hmm. So looking at the, the powers that Deadpool have and mm -hmm. Superman and Batman and <laughs> that type of thing. So you know, they're, they're publishable papers, they're yep. genuine papers. And he also talked about the economics of the Hunger Games, yep. uh, Brian O'Rourke. So there's a lot of economic concepts in that, both for lesson plans for academics to use mm -hmm. to teach to their students, but also for people who are interested in understanding economic concepts to apply that to and make it easier for them to understand the textbook kind of yep. material that we're kind of yeah. given or rigorously being taught. Yeah, so that's certainly systemic risk is a problem that I see like it's not going to go away. We saw it in 2008. We, the, the Asian contagion in the uh, 90s was a systemic crisis, savings and loan crisis in the 80s. This is something that comes up fairly regularly in modern economic history. And really, it's something that we talk about it for a year after the crisis, and then we seem to forget this is a problem. Yeah. So by yes. bringing it up in Star Wars, by bringing it up in Harry Potter, it can keep this in the public consciousness. Yes, and it's it's timeless as well because these books yep. are so classic and the movies are, are yep. class, timeless classics and they have they developed a culture and you know when people are interested in these they're they're seen as you know whatever geeks if you want to call us that <laughs> and that's going to make your paper and other people's papers be quite popular or timeless. Yes, fingers crossed. Fingers crossed. Fingers crossed. Zachary, thank you so much for being so inspiring and for joining me on Economic Rockstar. I had a blast and I personally learned a lot from you. Share again with our listeners where they can find you. Yeah, so they can find me at fictionomics.com or just Google It's a Trap, Emperor Palpatine's Poison Pill and you'll get to me. Yes, yeah, so, because I just typed in Fictionomics on Google and it was all there. 
You can find all the links to Zachary on economicrockstar.com forward slash Zachary Feinstein. Zachary, thank you so much for being so generous with your time. You are an economic rock star. Thank you for having me. It was a pleasure. Or an economic Jedi. <laughs> hey, thank you. If you enjoyed this podcast, why not leave some feedback or comments on the show notes page on economicrockstar.com where you can also sign up and be a member of the Economic Rockstar community. If you're listening to this episode on iTunes or Stitcher Radio, I would love to have some feedback and for you to leave an honest rating and review, as this will help with the rankings of the show so that more people can find it. If you're listening on the website economicrockstar.com, make sure you check out the back catalogue of all previous episodes and interviews with some amazing professors and authors at economicrockstar.com forward slash podcasts. Thanks for listening and I really appreciate your loyal support. I know how much you love audio, so why not get a free audiobook with Economic Rockstar today? I've teamed up with audiobooks.com to bring you this amazing offer. Visit audiobooks.com forward slash rockstar to download your free audiobook now.